Ready to go? <clears throat> All righty. Is this, I don't think this is on. Jennifer, I don't think this one's on. Testing, 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 test, 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 one. Testing, test, 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 test. Testing, test, 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 test. One, two, three, one, test, test, test. Okay, we'll go with that, and if you if you can get some help on, just so I, yeah, but I mean, so I don't have to project too much, because I'll, I tend to lose my voice if I do that. <clears throat> okay, all right, let's turn to Philippians chapter uh, 2. Okay, that's it. Thank you, ma'am. Philippians chapter 2. And uh, we're talking, uh, this, this course is the kenosis of Christ. According to the board, this is number seven. Yeah, go down just a hair. This is number seven, class number seven. Um, <clears throat> and um, for those who run equipment, uh, the name of this class will be equality or oneness, or as it's written on the board, oneness or equality, whichever way you want to write that. But it'd probably be good if you both wrote the same one. So let's go with the one on the board. Oneness or equality. In Philippians chapter 2, verse, starting at verse 5. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Um, and, and just so you know, because I don't think I mentioned this before. The word mind there, let this mind be in you, actually is not in the Greek. The actual Greek word there is let this attitude be in you. Yeah, this is not just a mental impartation of information. It is the attitude of Christ. Have the attitude of Christ, and then it begins to describe that. Who, being in the form of God, <clears throat> thought it not a thing to be grasped after. And that's what we decided. That's what we discovered. The actual Greek there is thought it not a thing to be grasped after or to held on, be held on to, to be equal with God. <clears throat> so this is where we're getting oneness or equality because we want to discuss this in light of this verse where it says he thought it not a thing to be grasped after or felt like he was being robbed because he was not equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, <clears throat> and there, even that, which you, if you have a Bible with a margin, it will say he emptied himself. All right, and we've, we've looked at this several different times and in several different ways. What did he empty himself of? Well, he didn't empty himself of being God, because to do that means he's no longer God. But what he did was he emptied himself, and we'll just put it like this, this class, so that we hit all the different angles. He emptied himself of equality with God in the outward form. Okay? Outwardly, he didn't look like God. He was a man. Outwardly, and, you know, it goes on to say that, who made himself a... Uh, uh, of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, <clears throat> he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And so here you have God, <clears throat> the Son of God, not striving to be equal with God. And we'll, we'll discuss this equality here in just a minute a little more. Um, that he chose to be, to not have the manifestation of the glory as the Son of God, but he became as the Son of Man. <clears throat> he left his glory as the Son of God. He left his glory as, the, as God and came down and appeared just like we do. <clears throat> and... Um, 
So I wanted, I want to discuss that in light of a couple of other verses in the New Testament. The first one is also still in Philippians over in chapter 4. So if you'll flip over to a couple of chapters, Philippians 4. In verse 11, <clears throat> Paul here speaking says, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I've learned in whatever state I am in this to be content. Now, now the key here <clears throat> is, is in relationship to let me write it down here. In whatever state I have found myself therein to be content. That means if God has brought you to Texas, <coughs> that you need to be content. However, that's not the true meaning of it. Um, the word state doesn't refer to this, our spiritual condition. That's, you need to understand that. It's not talking about your spiritual condition, but your outward position or status. And whatever outward position or status that you have been brought to, therein you need to be content. <clears throat> All right. This is in line with this self-emptying that Jesus did. However, there's a difference. This is Paul speaking here. And why wouldn't it? Why wouldn't it be that the man who is telling them to let this attitude be in you that was in Christ Jesus, why wouldn't he let this attitude be in him? that was in Christ Jesus. Why wouldn't we see proofs of it? He's not just a teacher. He's one who has desired for his life to line up with Christ, to live Christ, to have the manifestation of Christ in him. And so here he's going to state that. He's going to tell us to be that way. But then what surprise would it be that just within a few chapters in his dealing with life, he's going to show that his life is lined up with it. And so he says, um, I have learned in whatever state I find myself there to be content and that we should. Um, and then verse 12, I know both how to be abased and I know how abound. Everywhere in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and the suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. And so here he is giving us the, this example of a change of state outwardly and of status that has happened in his life or will happen where he is in a bountiful situation and he's learned to be content and he is in a situation of lack and he's learned to be content that in all things and all conditions, he has learned that his contentment is not based on the outward situation. Okay? Now, let's see if I've got... Uh, just, just the thought. I, I don't want to go quite yet to that point. Just this thought that Paul, um, Paul has recognized that his oneness with the Lord is higher than God proving in the outward that he's with God and equal with God. Now that is incredibly important, and we'll get into that at some juncture because I have a whole section I want to talk about on that in relationship to how the church has actually, the modern day church has formed up into a, a belief system that has to have God do miracles or supply finances or to do all these things to prove that they're of God and therefore there's, there's 
some equality. We're all, you know, we're with God because we believe him for all these things. Whereas Paul is saying, it doesn't matter if, I, if God blesses me or doesn't bless me. I am one with Jesus. Can you see the value of that? Can you see that, that mountains can fall into the sea and oneness doesn't change? That all that you possess can be taken away like Job and you're still one with the Lord. Okay, but then, but then what is the requirement there? The requirement has to be that the greatest thing to you is the Lord, not what the Lord gives you. Not only that, but it has to be that the proof to you that you are of God is oneness with Christ, not proofs that you are one with Christ. How about that? Do you understand what I'm saying? That he has to, you know, that he has to bring you through things. For, for example, and, and I'll go to the next thing that I was going to talk about. Um, uh, Jesus appeared as a criminal. Jesus was hung on a cross. Uh, Paul was thrown into prison. He was rejected. I mean, consider, consider Paul's situation. Paul was uh, well, let me, let me read something to you and then you respond to it, to me as amen or no, if this has any validity or not. And I've just sort of made the statement. Uh, Though Jesus appeared as a criminal on the cross or Paul was rejected in prison, they were stable in their relationship with God. Amen. Okay, is that good? Is that a good statement? Yes. Shall I read it again? Okay. Though Jesus appeared as a criminal on the cross or Paul was rejected in prison, they were stable in their relationship with God. Is that a good statement? Basically, we got amen from, from everybody. Okay. I, I'm in agreement. However, I think now we need to look at it in light of reality and not in light of the wonderful statements doctrines can say to us and we can nod our head in service after service. Let's just consider Paul for a minute. He was among the leaders. He was a Pharisee. He was among the highest people within the religion. And all of a sudden, he took a turn. And that turn started talking about Jesus in a whole nother light, started talking about Jesus in a, in a, in a picture that overshadowed everything else and went the exact opposite of everything that he stood for or believed before. And everybody in his religion started rejecting him. Okay? And everywhere he went, as far as it, when he was in Jerusalem or whatever, they thought he was a heretic. They thought he was crazy. You know, people, you know, what, what was it? Uh, one of the guys said, Paul, thou art beside thyself. There was a general feeling among religion in general that he lived in that you are not only off, you are really off. Though, uh, let's see, though Paul was rejected, thrown into prison, he was stable in his relationship with God. Do you still agree with that statement? Yes. But does it take a different light? Let's, okay, let's look at Jesus. Jesus came as the Messiah. He came unto his own and his own received him not. The basic flow of religion around him turned on him, rejected him, and killed him. Hung him on a cross, and while you're hanging on a cross, or while you're in prison, thrown there by the Jews, your own people, because they believe that you're off, and you've, messed, and you're, you're, you've gotten off on this thing, and you're alone in prison, or you are in there, and, and here's, here's the thing. You are in there with your own thoughts. And your thoughts, what will they say to you at that time? 
all you can hear is people rejecting the vast majority going against you, a flow and a flood that says this is the way it's begun, this is the way, they're saying of their way, this is the way it's begun since God talked to Moses and you're saying it's all different and your thoughts are going, do I really have the truth? Is, is anybody following? I mean, these wonderful statements are great. We can read them, and in church or Bible school, people can go, yes, amen. We're not shooting for that. We're shooting for the reality of God that Jesus gave up equality but lived in oneness with the Father. Okay, great truth. But he did it in the, in the trial. He did it when... Everything around him said, you're not right. How do you do that? How do you do that? You only do that by knowing oneness with him. Jason, before you came in, we were talking about this scripture where Paul said that I have learned that whatever state I find myself there and to be content. So if you're in Texas... We've moved on since then. We've actually gotten spiritual. But, um, but uh, as I was preparing to share this, it hit me. You know, these things are simply doctrines, and I don't even know if they're, I mean, we, we share so much in services or whatever. I don't even know that they're, our doctrines, even though we can say yes to them, I don't even know that they're our doctrine, much less the way that we live. Because how would you know that until you've been caught in a situation where everything's going in the opposite direction and everyone is saying, you, you're, you're the one that's got it wrong. You're the one that's out of order. You're the one that's messed up. You know, and let's face it. The way God made us as human beings is we want to be accepted by the, by the crowd. We want to be. We don't like the feeling of everybody thinking you're messed up, you're off, you're, you know. But that's exactly what they thought of Jesus, and it's exactly what they thought of Paul. Yes. Sure. Yes. If you can hear it, she's just talking about Joseph and what happened to him and that he was stripped of everything and there was no vindication and he was looked at as a criminal. And this is, this is where, and, and let's, let's put it like this. Much of religion has to have God prove outwardly by a miracle or by provision of some kind outwardly to prove that they're of God, and they need it regularly. It's like a drug. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I mean, I lived in that. <clears throat> and the great proof was when God did a miracle or when God did something for you or whatever, and, oh, I'm still with God. I'm still in that vein. And yet Jesus was stripped of all of that. Kenosis was stripped of all of that and learn to live in simply the oneness that he, and, and if you follow, like, Gospel of John's a great place to find this, where he always says, well, you know, uh, where was it when they said he was left alone somewhere? And he said, I'm not alone. Uh, me and the Father are together. Oneness. Yes. Right. 
and that's really the point. That's why we're here. That's why we're in this. If the Holy, what Kelly's saying is, if the Holy Spirit doesn't reveal this, doesn't reveal this oneness, because here is an absolute fact, folks. You can learn about the cross, but if you don't learn about the oneness with Christ, it doesn't. It's not going to do you any good in the crunch. Your doubts and fears and darkness. And uh, being locked away in a prison without anybody saying, praise God, you're of God, you're really doing good, you're really ministering to me. You know, you're thrown in a dungeon where there's nobody else but you and the, and the rats. And, you know, God's not doing anything. I mean, look at John the Baptist. He's thrown into prison, you know. Well, they say, this is what John says, they say, you're, you know, the lame are walking and the blind are seeing and everything, and, you know, are you the one? Because when you're locked away in prison alone with your own thoughts, your own thoughts are your worst enemy, you know? And you're locked away in that, and you hear Jesus is doing all this, other, this stuff for everybody else, and you're looking for a proof. Well, guess what? Jesus hadn't died on the cross and rose again at the point of John the Baptist. There was no oneness. You understand? He was the voice of one, but he wasn't one with the one yet. Okay, that did come, but it wasn't at that point. So we excuse John, if you will, and we should, because he didn't have what we have. But folks, I can tell you, there have probably been nights where you've laid there under attack from the enemy, and gone through all sorts of junk wondering, am I right? Is this right? Have I got it with the Lord? Am I? Well, if somebody asked you at that moment, do you believe Jesus died on the cross? You'd say, yeah. Do you believe you died with him? Yeah. Do you believe all the doctrines of Christ is life or Acts Bible school or new creation? Yeah. Do you have faith right now in your oneness with him? No, I'm doubting. I'm doubting me. I'm doubting where I'm at in relationship to him. Is anybody following this? I mean, this is, this is big stuff because we all go through it. What is the kenosis about? Is it just another doctrine that we're supposed to be taught because it's, it's a, a theological thing? My God, I hope not. I hope that every ounce of this stuff has application in a practical way for our lives so that when you do go through the valley of the shadow of death, you will fear no evil because thou art with me and the witness of it is oneness. Okay? If you go by what you've done lately, you're in trouble. If you go by how good you've been doing, you're in trouble. You cannot go by that. Do I want you to do bad? No. Would God allow you to, to mess up, to test your faith in oneness? Is it a walk of faith? Or is it a walk of works? Then the Lord will test you to see if it's truly a walk of faith. He will, you know, we say the devil's attacking right now. Well, it may be the devil, but God withdraws his hand to see where you're at. Because you know what? We think that the goal of God is to keep the devil off of us. I got news for you. He, he sick the devil on Jesus. He sick the devil on Job. Can I get amen on any of that? Yeah.
And let me, let me qualify. Well, you know, I mean, I said God sick the devil on Job and da-da-da. That's not the best way of putting it. The truth is God withdraws the hedge and lets the enemy in. He doesn't sick the devil on you, but the devil will attack you. But he does that, and a lot of people don't believe what we're talking about right now. And, and he does that to, to, to test our faith, to refine us, to, to get us more in with him. He never does it just to allow the enemy attack us or to tear us down. And I, and I tell you what, the only true way to, to, to have oneness at work in your life in a powerful way is for it to have been tested enough times you understand what I'm saying? Where it's been tested and you can scream if necessary into the face of the devil, the darkness and everything else. I don't care what I feel. I don't care what's going on. I don't care what you say, my own head or devil or carnal mind. I am one with Jesus because he did that, not me. I didn't earn it. He died for it. He wanted it. And he initiated it. And I just, oh, what about me? I simply believe in it. And, and folks, you know, that's the way I just shared that. That's a good shouting point in church. But that's not why I did it that way. Because I don't want it to be a shouting point in church. I want it to be a stand we make in darkness. Because he's not going to show you equality by by showing you that he's with you and he's, he'll do anything outwardly with you outwardly. Do you understand the difference? Oneness inwardly, outwardly, he does not have to give me proof. Okay? All right. So, we hadn't really even got very far in this scripture because I wanted to hit several things, but maybe I... Um, maybe I should... Go ahead with what I'm thinking here, though. Um, <clears throat> so in verse 13, he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. And we all know, everyone here knows how badly that scripture has been perverted. That the average church member teaches, I can do all things through Christ. I can drive an 18-wheeler. I can do brain surgery. Please don't try it on me, and please don't drive in my neighborhood, you know. I, I can do all things. I can do anything. Brothers and sisters, you can do anything through Christ. Most of those brothers and sisters they're talking to, they can do anything except one thing, and that is do without. And yet, what is he saying? He says, I can do all things. I can be abased or abound. I can suffer loss and still be with the Lord, still be in oneness, and still not doubt because equality is not proven. And, and besides, it's not about equality. But I don't need equality with God by him proving things that I'm with him. I am one. That proof has come into my spirit by revelation, by the power of the Holy Spirit who showed me the death, burial, and resurrection, that I was one with Jesus, not in resurrection, but in death, that he made me one with him in the Garden of Gethsemane, took me to the cross, crucified me, and that I wouldn't even be crucified if I hadn't been one with him in advance of that. Nor would have I gone to the cross in advance of that. And then you say, thank God for oneness that brought me to death. And then you say, thank God for oneness that brought me up in him and I am now accepted in the oneness, in the beloved. Did you have a comment? Well, when I talk about oneness, I'm really only talking about one. 
and he's the one. We say, I'm, I mean, here, here's what I said. I'm one with Jesus, and he's the one. That's the way I always put it. Because we have a, a remarkable talent for getting us in there, even after we've been crucified and put away, you know. I'm one with Jesus, but in our mind, there's two. You know, I mean, how, how does that work? Well, it works by carnality. The carnal mind scraping and scratching to, to be, I've got to be in there somewhere, you know. Well, you, you are, you are his body, but you are not the life source. You are not the life. You are not the fullness. He is that, and he's that in you because he's the one. And you embrace that. And therefore, if he's the one, then he's one with the Father. And as Kelly was just saying, your relationship with the Father is through the Son. God reveals his Son in you, you cry, Abba, Father. Didn't say God revealed sonship in you and you cry, Abba, Father. He reveals the Son, then the Son cries. And it says that. The Son cries out of your heart, Abba, Father. Well, who's doing the crime? The son. Where is he located? In you. What's your relationship with the father? The son. Why and on what basis? Oneness. And to those who have comprehended why he made you one and took you to the cross, you have no problem with the things I just said. You know the depth of your lack and your problems and your ugliness and your selfishness and all of that. You've been through it enough times that you're ready to embrace Jesus as all and in all. You have no hope in yourself. It's only the people that have hope in themselves that keep trying to work themselves into this. But the people who don't love this gospel, they love it. It's the only way out for them. And it's the only way in for them. <clears throat> All right. So let's see. I, I want to read that statement one more time now in light of what we just said. Though Jesus appeared as a criminal on the cross or Paul was rejected and thrown in prison, they were stable in their relationship with God. So, so just quickly picture Paul in prison. Picture Jesus on the cross. Picture uh, uh, people, uh, you know, mocking. Picture uh, the vast majority of religion saying that, that Paul is messed up. And picture the ringing, stinging thoughts of that coming upon you. And then picture this, someone saying, but I know that I am one with, with him. I know that that never changes. It'll never change in his heart and it'll never change in my heart because this is the truth that he has revealed to my heart. And folks, someone with a, how's that go? Someone with a, with a doctrine will never overcome someone that has experienced the reality of this. Someone with an <coughs> argument will never be able to overturn somebody who has had a life experience of the revelation of Christ. They can tell, they can argue, they can better argue than you. They can bring scriptural scriptures that they call scriptural proof. You know, the devil did bring a scripture to Jesus and it would call scriptural proof. Did you know that when he was tempting Jesus? When he tempts you, you don't think he'll use the scriptures? And, and then call it scriptural proof? You better believe it but it has no power. The, you know, you are not at the mercy of a person with a good argument. Even if your mind cannot refute what they're saying, you know that's the truth. And no one can shake you loose from that. All right. Um, 
they did not have to appear equal with God. They knew who they were, and they knew how God viewed them regardless of their circumstances. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's an eternal reality that's sunk into somebody that can do that, regardless of their circumstances and regardless of, of how other people view you, you know how God views you. Okay. Great, again, great teaching, great doctrine. But only those, only those who have truly seen this by means of the Holy Spirit will make it through the dark hour, the dark trial. Okay, you say, well, then what does that mean? Because I know how everybody thinks. They're the only ones who make it through. I know I won't make it. You know, some people, that's the way they think. It doesn't matter what you say. They're going to be the one that, I'm, I won't be the one that will make it. You know. Uh, you know, my problem was the other way. Honestly, honestly it was. It doesn't matter. You know, I used to say the old line, you know, I got vision and the rest of the world wears bifocals. You know, everything go bad and somehow I land on my feet. Well, that's sort of changed over the last 10 years. First 50 years were that way and the last 10 years have felt like, you know, running through the gauntlet and having people just beat the fool out of you but I'm still one with Jesus. And not because I'm, I have a positive personality and winning ways. <laughs> no, not because of that, but because God has revealed not just his son in me in some sort of revelatory way, because God has revealed this oneness that took place at the cross and in the resurrection, and I have had it tested under fire, and I know that I believe that. And, and I remember now, it was, it, it's been, good grief, it's been 25 years since the first real test of that came because I was with an organization where everybody believed this. It was the belief system that we believed and then I ended up leaving there and feeling all alone and for the first time in my walk was not part of those people and I went into deep darkness and fear over so many things except just one or two little things. I couldn't organize my thoughts and my doctrines. Do you know that that gets scary when your little pigeonholes get all broken apart and mixed up and you can't, I can't organize my thoughts. I can't get it together. You know, it's almost like this. What do I believe? Anybody been there? I mean, and it's like, but deep within, not within the head, but deep within my core, because God had begun a work in me to reveal his son, I, I only knew this. I am dead because I, Jesus died on the cross. He said it. I don't care what I do. I believe that, and I believe I'm one with him. And the rest of it's just going to have to find its place eventually, but right now I'm not going to be moved from that. It's, it felt like everything around me was going like this, like sh everything that can be shook would be shook. You know, it's like, what's going on, you know? And I was waiting, and, and what was I waiting for? What was I looking for? God to do something to prove that I was equal with God, meaning I was with God. I was, do a miracle, do something, give me, give me a sign, give me a word, you know. Do you understand what I'm saying? Anybody know what that's about? Where you're, going, you're looking for just some outward thing. Give me something, Lord. And at that moment, and he'll do that if that's all you got. Do you understand? I mean, he will because he's good. But there's going to come a day that he'll quit doing that. And he will say, no, I'm, not, I'm tired of giving you stuff because you keep relying on the stuff I do for you. You keep coming back up 
and shoving what I just did in the face of the detractors that made you, that said you weren't of God and saying, look, see, this proves it. See this miracle? See this thing God did for me? I really am of God. Anybody following this? And he said, I'm not going to do that anymore. I don't want you living on the outward. I don't want you depending on outward circumstances. I want you to know from top to bottom that you are one with me and you can stand under any circumstance and, and be secure in that. Period. And he shuts it down, baby, and he will. There's no question about it. He will. Um, so it's good to hear this early so that you kind of know what you're going into because, man, he quits. When I say shuts it down, I don't just mean outward miracles. He quits giving you feelings that he's there. I mean, you lose all thought and feeling that he's there, and, and you're, you're going to have to go by something that is deep within your core that you have had revealed by God. I am one. I don't feel like it. And, in fact, he might even allow feelings that say the opposite. Like, I feel the enemy all over me. I feel like I'm off. Okay. Let's consider that. I feel like I'm off. Can that be a powerful motivation? Yes, it can. Shh, next question. <laughs> Should we go by feelings? Okay. Is there anybody practically in Christianity that knows we shouldn't go by feelings? Most everybody does know that, right? Do you think a few within Christianity go by feelings? No. <laughs> I think most of them go by feelings. I think most are motivated by the feelings or the lack thereof. Okay? Now just because I think that doesn't make it true, but I, I think I'm right. I have a strange suspicion. And so when you cut off those feelings that, it, that you know, because it's a wonderful thing to wake. I mean, I'm picturing someone waking up in a nice fluffy bed with fluffy pillows and the sun coming through the, the window shade, hitting your face. You go, oh. It's a beautiful day and I feel good. And, you know, I don't, I mean, it's been so long I've felt that or experienced that. I don't even know what it is. And that's the truth. I mean, I, I would love to. I would love to. But I wake up and just go, oh, my God, I feel like I didn't even, you know, sleep. And I feel like I've been beat to death. And that's okay. That's my situation. And, and it, it uh, if nothing else, it has taught me when you get up in the morning, you don't go by feelings. Jesus is with you. You're a son of God. You've got a purpose in life. You need to get up and go for the Lord. And I've learned to do that. So I get up and it doesn't matter what I feel like. It just doesn't. But I picture somebody, the sun coming, and they're going, oh, it's a beautiful morning, you know. Praise God. Well, you know, what if the house caves in on you? What if the, the, the thunderstorm comes up? Everything goes dark. What if a nuclear attack hits the, you know, the United States and flattens everything, and you and seven other people are alive on the, on the continent? Well, I mean, what? What if? You're still one with Jesus. You were left here for a purpose. Your purpose hasn't changed. Am I right or wrong? Your purpose is to manifest Christ, to know Christ, and to be a, a vessel to others of Christ. It doesn't matter. I have learned in whatever state I find myself there and to be content. Would you be content if you went to bed in Texas and woke up in New Jersey? <laughs> yes.
Amen. Well, I mean, my experience has been uh, over the last, whatever, 10 years, 12 years, you know, you're in darkness and there's all this, you know, stuff, just, you know, incredible stuff going on. And then finally you see a light at the end of the tunnel and you discover it's a train. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like, oh my God, can it get any worse? I thought this was the light at the end of the tunnel. <clears throat> well... You put one foot in front of the other. When you can't see where you're going, when, when it looks like where you're going is there's no other direction but bad, you put one foot in front of the other for the Lord. For the Lord. And eventually, hopefully, either one or two things is going to happen. Either God's going to bring you out into the light of day or are you going to get so used to being with him in any circumstances that it really doesn't matter? Amen. I mean, is that a possibility? Yes. Would that be, uh, you know, would that be a possibility? And I say, yes. man, I think, I think that that's more valuable than delivering us every time from everything where we haven't learned the important, I mean, is there any higher important message than oneness with Christ? It gets you through, excuse me, it gets you through everything. But it does more than that. It elevates you out of you and all of the problems that go with you. <laughs> and it puts you into oneness with him so that his resources, his patience, his love, his long suffering. Huh? I mean, I fear that most Christians don't even know what long suffering is. They know what they they've experienced short suffering. You know, you know, the fruit of the spirit is, you know, short suffering. <laughs> you know, but it's not. It's long suffering, and you know, the only way to learn that is to. I mean, honestly. Here's another romantic deal. We read the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, gentleness, meekness, faith, long-suffering. means you suffer a long time. That's the fruit of the Spirit. <laughs> but it's patient in suffering. Patient in suffering, being with the Lord, being, I'm going to say, honorable in suffering by being patient, by trusting the Lord. There's your love, joy, peace. There's there, your, your, your love is the Lord. Your peace is the Lord. Your joy is only the Lord. It's all you got left. But it's, it's brought you, you know, anybody ever read, the, what is that, Hind's Feet on High Places? Anybody ever read that book? What is it, Much Afraid? Isn't that the name of the, the main character that's making this journey up into the high places? Did anybody that has read the book ever wondered why her two constant companions is, is suffering and sorrow? Why the heck suffering and sorrow? You know, I mean, didn't the, didn't the scripture say, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life? Yeah, they never seem to catch up to me. <laughs> They're following back there, all right, but I'd like for them to be in front, sort of paved the way like an icebreaker, you know. <clears throat> we, we, uh, we don't understand that. And yet, much of the Christian life is going to involve some sort of suffering or trial or whatever with the purpose because it says to test to test you you know what is it how does it say that in Peter uh, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to test you as if some strange thing happened to you so then we get in the trial what do we think this is strange <laughs> you know 
Well, we know that, Steve. <laughs> me, and, me and Steve have a strange and wonderful relationship. He's strange and I'm wonderful. <laughs> All right, don't start. Whoa, whoa, I should never have done that one. <clears throat> All right, so let, let's go to another scripture real quick. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 13, and I'll make this my bridge scripture to the next scripture section that we want to deal with. Hebrews 13. <clears throat> Got out of that one. And verse 5. <clears throat> All right. You there? Okay. Hebrews 13, verse 5. Let your manner of life, uh, some of your Bibles, if you have King James, it'll say let your conversation it's not really talking about how you talk. That really is the actual word there is your manner of life. Let your manner of life be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Okay. Uh, I'm going to comment on this and then when we come back, I'll probably pick this verse up again um, to, to help you see the next section that we're going to move into here. Um, here it's saying, let, now remember the word that we're really concentrating on here is this word content. Paul said, whatever state I find myself in, therein to be content. But the thing that makes you content is not equality with God by proofs that you're up there with God. It is by oneness. Okay, so contentment, according to what we're saying, is going to have to be by oneness or there's not going to be any contentment. Okay, so be content in whatever state, in whatever outward status or thing that you find yourself in, because oneness is the higher thing. So now we read uh, verse 5. Let your manner of life be without covetousness. All right. Where does covetousness come from? A lot of times, covetousness comes from discontentment. All right. Now we're getting to the heart of some things, aren't we? Because discontentment is the result of outward things, which is looking for some sort of equality with God and, and other Christians by some sort of form that God does something outwardly, whereas oneness, true oneness eliminates covetousness. But, but wait, why? why? Why would oneness actually eliminate covetousness? Okay, well, I'll tell you that. <laughs> it does it because anyone who's one has everything that you have. If you're one with Jesus, you have him in fullness, amen? amen? And if I'm one with Jesus, I have him in fullness. Is that right or wrong? Right. And if we're all one with Jesus, all of Christianity has access to his fullness. Now let's, let's admit, Let's admit, a twig has all fullness available to it, doesn't it? Yeah. But a big branch may be taking advantage of more of that. Do you see what I'm saying? The twig is not given less. He just can't handle more. Yeah. Will he in time, because if he stays attached? Absolutely. Absolutely. So his job will simply not be to, to claim more. I'm using the charismatic thing. I don't claim that. Well, I claim that, brother. Well, you don't have to claim more in Christ. All you got to do is learn to open up and give him more room in you. And with as you grow in him, grow up in him in all things. Doesn't it say that in Ephesians? To grow up in him in all things, in union with him in all things, 
So the, the truth is we all have the same access and the same resources in Christ and nobody has more or less than others. All right? <clears throat> All right. That being true, then let your manner of life be without covetousness. Well, what's that saying then? Let your manner of life be based on oneness, not looking for equality with God. Amen. But let's read on. Let your manner of life be without covetousness, and be content with th such things as you have. Amen. All right, well, that's tough on Americans right there. Mm -hmm. They're not content. They always want more. We are a nation of consumers. We consume. We ravage. We eat up everything that we can Swallow up all the world's oil and gas reserves. <laughs> Go out, I mean, just consume. I mean, do you get a picture of a consumer? Just, <laughs> you know? And yet, somehow we're able to put that on the news and say, we're a nation of consumers. And we all go, yeah, that's great. Nobody goes, my God, we're a bunch of ravenous pigs. Be content with such things as you have. Why, 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 why? For God's sake, give me a reason why I should do that. Let your manner of life be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Here's your oneness. Base it on oneness. Base it on oneness, and if you if it all is based on oneness, then if you have if you if you abound or you're abased, what's really important, what's really eternal, what's really able to get you out of the dark places, is oneness. I will never leave you or forsake you. I am one with you. You are one with me. This is settled. You don't have, you know, and again, there is no covetousness in oneness. Not, not in the sense of what we think. There may be hunger. You know, and in fact, it's sort of interesting the way it says it in Philippians there. But really, if you look at it there, he's, he's actually, it appears to me that he's saying, I've learned to suffer loss or, or to abound. I've learned to do without or to have a bunch and he almost sounds like he's saying it at this, that at the same moment, I've learned to be hungry and yet satisfied. It really does. I mean, if you look at it, I, don't, I know I've never shared it that way, but I think that's what he's also saying. But he's saying it based on oneness. And he's saying in the Lord, I'm always hungry for more of him, and yet I'm satisfied because I have him. And you, you come to a place where, you know, you know, people say, well, you, Randy, you think you got all the answers. I mean, I've, you know, I'm told all sorts of stuff. You think you got all the answers. I said, no, I, but I do have the answer. I mean, let's get honest here. This is about Christ. I got the answer. All right, so we need to quit. We'll come back next class and we'll, we'll bounce off of Hebrews 13 here and then move on.